one of those handed out now, or do you want to wait till later? Or how do you want to do that? The end? Okay, sure. We didn't know how many people were going to be here, so we just picked up a random number. We have a brochure. We have, this is a little ditty that was funded by the phone company about 10, 15 years ago for school children. But I provide the information from my graduate school research on the Frontier Ohio Valley, so there's no fiction in it. It's all true. And some of this stuff you won't find anywhere else if you're interested in that period of history. And here is a pile of our latest issue of our newsletter put out by our friends of Leonard Hassett group. So, Dory back there is hoping that some of you will sign up as volunteers on the island um, before today's over. She drives all the way from Logan three days a week to do her job there. She was a volunteer before she became our paid volunteer coordinator. And she's one of those employees where you scratch your head and you say, we ever do without her before today. So, truth is the truth. All right, I'm going to show you some quick pictures, slides of the island. I know some of you younger ones, this is an historic event to you, because this will probably be the last time you'll ever see a slide projector. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's shaking her head. Yeah. Um, we're too poor right now to afford a PowerPoint machine and I'm probably too mechanically retarded to know how to run it, so I'm still hugging my old slide projector. Technology's passed me by, I can't even see it in the road up ahead anymore. But I do know how to use a computer, because when I found out you could do history research on a computer, I learned that part. Okay, Butter has an island, its first public park opened in 1886. It lasted through 1912. The 1913 flood wiped out most of the park buildings on the island. It's, the park's demise was coming down the road anyway because of the automobile, movies, etc. Increased mobility of society, we're putting uh, the small local parks out of business. People wanted better hijinks than going over and picnicking in the area where they lived. They wanted to jump in their automobiles or on a bus and travel and see the sights. They wanted to go to the movies and so on and so forth. So the park was never reopened after 1913. There was a small private park that was operated by the owner of the island from 1935 until he died in 1955 at his home in Baton Rouge. He was vice president, retired, of Louisiana Standard Oil and its treasurer. His family had owned the island since his grandfather bought it from Harmon Blennerhassett's business partner in 1827. The man who ran the park was named Amos K. Gordon, Sr. After he died, his children eventually sold it to the DuPont Corporation, which still owns it. The largest DuPont facility in the world lies off the lower downstream western end of the island at a place called Washington, West Virginia, which is really a suburb of Parkersburg. DuPont needs the island for its water wells. The water that comes from the island runs their plastics operation. Now they're in the process of selling off most of that, so we don't know what the future of the island is going to be, but the state of West Virginia has had under lease from 1978. The first park or the park that's now operated on the island opened in 1980, on July 27th. And it's been going strong ever since. We've had people from most of the countries in the world. Leonard has an island, you've got to understand, in the 19th century was a world famous site, and it certainly was a household word in the United States. Anyone who even read a little bit knew the name Leonard Hassett because it was the famous site of the dreaded, treacherous, tragic, nefarious bird conspiracy. <laughs> conspiracy, that's the operative word. Many historians are coming around to believe there was no conspiracy, but we won't have time to get into that tonight. If you come down to the island, 
Uh, our tour guides will tell you more about that. Anyway, it was fame, his fame was based on that event, that Aaron Burr used it as the headquarters for his still mysterious Western expedition, military expedition, which he formed in 1805 and culminated <clears throat> in his trial in Richmond, Virginia on the charge of high treason. The worst enemy that Aaron Burr had in the world was his former partner in the executive suite in Washington, D.C., and that was Thomas Jefferson. Aaron Burr served as the third vice president of the United States from 1800, 1801 to 1805. And Jefferson didn't like Burr. He wasn't Virginian, for one thing. And he was a brilliant soldier during the Revolution, a real hero. He was one of the sharpest politicians and a lawyer with a mind like a steel trap. So Jefferson was sort of pretty jealous of his running mate. And what killed any affection or respect that Jefferson may have had for Burr was when Burr almost became president instead of Jefferson. The Constitution had a little flaw in it. It did not provide for separate balloting for the president and vice president, because none of the founding fathers ever suspected that there would be a tie. But there was a tie for 36 ballots. And Jefferson finally eked out his victory as president by six votes. And he never forgave Burr for coming that close to snatching away the big prize. Even though Burr had issued a letter early in the election that he was not running for president that to vote for Jefferson. The Federalists who were Jefferson's opponents saw this as too good an opportunity maybe to get rid of it. But anyway, now that you've had a great deal more information that you ever wanted to know about Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, and Leonard Hesson Island, let's start with our pictures. We'll need the lights out. That's good. They good? Can you all see? Yes. yes. Sure? Sure. Okay. This is an aerial view of Flutter Hassett Island. You see Parkersburg right here. Uh, that's my little red light machine here. This is Parkersburg right down here with the Little Canal River flowing into the Ohio. This is Belfry, Ohio. And the Ohio River plays a trick on you at Belfry and Parkersburg. Instead of flowing south, southwest, as it does, generally, it makes a 45 degree turn, goes straight west, so it gets past the island, and then you can see it starts flowing south, southwest again. Now, what's the result of this? Well, the public, before they come to the island, is confused anyway, and they have no idea what the cardinal directions are, whether the north, south, east, or west. And certainly our local newspaper reporters have never mastered that. But that's a little trick that nature played. It used to be 500 acres until the Millville Dam was built in 1968. And it went down to 381 acres. And this was not revealed publicly until 2005 when one of my coworkers and I did a picture book on Flutterhassett Island for the Arcadia people down in Charleston, South Carolina. They have a whole series of these, and you probably sell them in your gift shop here, Arcadia picture books. So we did one on the island. And in my research, I stumbled across this. DuPont finally confessed up. They were afraid the public would be angry at this damage done to one of the most famous sites in American history. This is the man for whom the island was named, along with his wife, Margaret, Harmon Blunner Hassett, born in England in 1764. Harmon never knew he went to his grave without knowing the year of his birth. He wrote in his diary, his journal that he kept when he was in prison in Richmond, awaiting trial at the Burr treason trial, which he never did have to go on trial because Burr was acquitted that his father and mother could agree on the day of the month, which was October 8th, but not the year. One insisted it was 1764, and the other said 65. And it wasn't until I was doing research for my doctoral dissertation in England 
1976, I went to the local archives and found out that Bonner Hassett was born in the earlier year. That was when he was, we don't have his birth record, even though he recorded in his diary as far as month and day, but his baptism was recorded and he was baptized in the earlier year. This is the only known likeness other than a silhouette in which his nose, he had a big hook nose, was pretty up. This was painted, this miniature painted on ivory in a gold frame with 70 matched pearls. It was painted in London in 1795 or early 96. Butter Hassett decided to sell his property, his 7,000 acre estate in Ireland in 1795. This had been the family since the 17th century and immigrated to America. Well, the saying goes, dukes don't immigrate. This was a very unusual decision for any European aristocrat to give up all the creature comforts and the social privileges to which his rank was then entitled and move to America. It'd be like us packing our bags and moving to the north of Alaska today. So one of the first things that his new neighbors on the Ohio asked when he and Margaret settled on their island was, why did you come here? And he told them the truth. He had gotten involved with the United Irishmen, which was the IRA of his day, plotting to free Ireland from English rule. He was the secretary of the organization. And he knew once the organization turned radical and started planning an armed outbreak, it was a reform group when he joined it, that the officers would be gathered up first, arrested, tried, and probably hanged, because they were guilty of treason in the eyes of England, which then ruled Ireland. So he decided to sell up and get out before this new revolution, which did erupt in 1798, two years after he immigrated to America, came about and put him at risk with life and certainly his property, because he was a wealthy man. This is the back of his miniature showing his hair with his initials HB Gold Filigree. We found this in Hawaii in 1979 where it belonged to Glenner Hassett's great 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 grand niece. And she was an old lady dying of emphysema. And she decided that since this was a West Virginia state treasure, it should come back home. So she sold it to us at a very good price. This is the only known likeness of Margaret Leonard Hassett. It's owned by the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis. There was a miniature of the same design, oval in a gold frame with 70 matched pearls embedded in the frame, that Leonard Hassett wore as a locket. These were locket miniatures. Harmon wore Margaret's, at least he was supposed to, and Margaret wore her husband's. Except Harmon was a naughty boy, but he was coming back north after, before the Burr trial erupted and after the conspiracy collapsed down south. He was not wearing his locket around his neck like he was supposed to. It was in his saddlebag and someone stole it. It was never recovered and he about had a nervous breakdown. So finally, Margaret, had, it was much more commonsensical than her <coughs> husband, had to calm him down by saying, look, honey child, you still got the original, so what are you worried about? <laughs> this was painted when the Butter Hasses went to Montreal to live in 1824 after they had left America. And this is a 1870s magazine, Harper's Magazine artist, fanciful rendition of Margaret riding her horse. This is one of the most famous scenes enacted while the Blennerhassets lived on the island. Her rides through the woods on her horse Robin, <coughs> side saddle of course, because the lady never rode astride. Today there's only one woman in the world who still regularly rides astride. Do you know who she is? Some of you do. I've never spoken to an audience yet that didn't guess. 
Lady Gaga. I think you're confusing her with Lady Godiva. <laughs> Anyone? You're going to hate yourselves. Going? One, two. Queen of England. Yes. You saved the honor of the group. Queen Elizabeth. Nice woman. <laughs> and she wrote so fast, according to one of her neighbors, that her groom, Ransom Reed, whom you see in the background there, who was dressed in livery and always accompanied his mistress, she had to stop and wait for a half hour for him to catch up with her. Blennerhassett Island, when the Blennerhassetts lived on it, was not the one big island that we have today. It was a cluster of five islands. This is a painting by a Marietta artist done around 1840 of the western or lower end of the island showing one of the satellite islands that lay off of it in the Virginia, now the West Virginia Channel, which lies to the south. This is what Marietta looked like in its heyday. It was a port, ocean-going port. It built ocean-going vessels there that traded mainly with the West Indies, carrying local produce, local garden produce, crops, port to Cincinnati. Butter has its enterprise of investing in these gave Cincinnati its start in the meatpacking industry, which was the big noise in that industry long before Chicago took over the crown. The Ohio Valley was a frontier when the Blennerhassets arrived here in November 1796 when they arrived in Pittsburgh, spent the winter there, having previously visited Philadelphia and New York. In the summer of 1797, Blatterhassett started down river alone. Uh, he came to Marietta looking for a new home. He came to Marietta, liked the people, the location. He abandoned his plans for going as far as Tennessee to find a home for him and Margaret back upstream and got her. They started looking around Marietta in the area in 1797 and found an island 12 miles below Marietta in the river called Belfry or Bacchus Island after the man who then owned it, Elijah Bacchus, bought the upper half of it in 1798 and that year moved on to it and started building their new home. But the frontier area of the Ohio Valley was astounding to the Blunderhouse. They were astounded by the trees. There were sycamore trees in the Ohio Valley then, and not, they weren't a rarity, that were 19 and a half feet in diameter, not circumference, but diameter. Try measuring off 19 and a half feet sometime. But this is virgin timber. The Indians had very few occasions to chop down timber, uh, except to make corn feed. The animals were strange to the Blennerhassets. The last of the buffalo were still here. And prehistoric Indian works. This is a, one of the largest in the area. It was, we think, situated on top of Fort Borman Hill, which is today a county park in Parkersburg. It overlooks downtown Parkersburg. It was never developed. And it gives you one of the best sites of Blennerhassett Island on the Ohio River that you will ever see. So when you come down, maybe you can work in time to see Fort Borman. <coughs> this is the earliest view we have of Blunderhassett Mansion. Blunderhassett became famous in American history for two reasons. Number one, the chief reason, was their involvement with the Eric Burr and, and conspiracy and the fact that the federal government during Burr's trial designated the island as the official headquarters of his conspiracy. Secondly, they were, became famous for the great house that they built on the island. This is one of the show places of America, let alone the American West. But it was considered the largest and most beautiful home in the American West, west of the Allegheny Mountains at that time. And that's taking in quite a stretch of territory. That's taking in New Orleans, St. Louis. And this isn't local historical society pride saying, oh, the mansion over there on the island was the best in the West. We have traveler's accounts that say this unequivocally. This is the more accurate. There's another view that was done about the same time that is not accurate, so I don't show that to people. 
The house contains 7,000 square feet of interior living space. It's not clean attics and cellars. Glenner has has brought furniture with them from England. <coughs> they have ordered additional furniture from Philadelphia and Baltimore. We have the lists of the items that they built. They had oriental carpets, huge mirror. <coughs> the windows in the window panes, that were called lights back then, were an amazement to local settlers because most people were too poor in the Ohio Valley to afford window glass. They used scraped animal skins or parchment paper, which they oiled and let a little bit of light go through. So this was a Taj Mahal of the frontier of Ohio Valley. This is the man, Aaron Burr, I've already told you about him. And you ladies who are present ought to get down on your knees and be thankful that he's not still alive because as the saying goes, he was a lion with the ladies. And he left, shall we say, illegitimate offspring wherever he went. And women were just helpless. He was just, uh, he was, they were like catnip to her. He couldn't help himself. He was one of the great ladies' men of the uh, Federalist period of American history. When the state of West Virginia, by legislative statute, organized Blennerhassett Island State Park, Blennerhassett Historical State Park, we did not get the name Island added to our name, and it had to be added by state legislative statute 12 years after we opened the island as a park. We had a group in Lexington, Kentucky, organized a development plan for us, master plan. And the one thing that came out of that, because master plans are great, but the people they usually do them for don't have any money, so it's just lays on the shelf. But the one thing we got out of our $250,000 was the word island was added to our park name. And that dates from about the early 90s. When we opened up the park in 1980, it had just begun to be cleared of the jungle weeds that covered it. The weeds were higher than a man's head. And one of the first things my first boss did, I'm now in my fifth boss, Pamela and I are, we started at the same time, was to hire a company to clear off the head of the island. And they underestimated the cost and went bankrupt. But anyway, they got the, <laughs> the island cleared. Previous to the clearing of the island, previous to the state organizing the park by legislative statute, was the discovery of the Blenheim has a mansion by two separate teams of state archaeologists in 1974-1975. Their big accomplishment, other than finding prehistoric Indian villages, was to discover the original foundation stones of the mansion, which gave us the exact dimensions of the house which meant that if the money was ever forthcoming, the house could be rebuilt accurately. After the clearing was over, the lawns were planted, Blatterhassett's ghosts were still roaming the island, they would have felt more, a lot more at home. And we do have ghost sightings of Margaret all the time. No one's ever claimed to, to see Harmon. I've never understood that. But she was the more dynamic of the two. 1984, the state started rebuilding the mansion. They did this from pressure from the public. All the visitors who came on shore to visit the island said, well, when are you going to start rebuilding the house? They thought this was a natural item to be planned. The state didn't have any idea of rebuilding the house. But finally, they did, due to public pressure. So I'm going to show you some stages of the rebuilding here. before the two wing buildings were connected with the center structure with porticos. Yes, sir? What happened to the original? Did it just, just, just what started? happened to the original? The original house was completed September 18, <coughs> 1800, and the Blunder has just moved into it. They fled downriver in December 1806 as a result of being involved with Burr Act. 
conspiracy. The local militia, the Wood County militia, was alarmed at all this terrible treason being hatched in their backyard. They decided to invade the island and capture Blennerhazard and Burr's soldiers who were temporarily stationed there. Someone tipped Blennerhazard off. At midnight on December 11, 1806, he and Burr's soldiers fled downriver. Early the next morning, the citizen soldiers poured on shore. They captured Margaret and her two small children, held them prisoners for six days before they were allowed to go downstream to join uh, Harmon. The house was rented out initially by the Blunderhassets, then taken out of their control and by a creditor. And he rented it out to a man who grew hemp on the island, which supplied the rope works to Marietta. This man, whose name was Neil, was living in the island on the mansion with his family, stored hemp in the wine cellar underneath the North Wing building, which is the building on the right, which served as Blennerhazard's office, library, and laboratory. He had a chemical laboratory as part of his setup on the island. Had the hemp stored there, they had it stored in the walkways connecting the wing buildings to the central structure. Those walkways, we now know, had a solid wall with windows and doors in them on the weather side, downstream side, the west side of the mansion, which is on the other side of what we're looking at now. The house did not have a back side. It was double fronted, as many of the Virginia plantation homes in the 18th and early 19th century were. Slaves accidentally caught this hemp on fire when they were rooting around the wine cellar. We don't know why they went there, because there was no more wine. I Maybe mean, they just, it was off limits to them, and they thought that the wine was kept there. Set that on fire, instead of alarming Mr. Neal, I had a theory they went there to get hemp to smoke. And I, in the 80s, announced this at a meeting of the Charleston Women's Club, and Governor um, Underwood, ex-Governor Underwood was there. It was covered by the Charleston Gazette. It went out over the AP that he, the historian says, pot smoking slaves burned down the water has a <laughs> My boss was sitting watching the late news on the TV. He went, he called me up, and I won't tell you what he called me. But <laughs> there were no repercussions of that. But anyway, instead of alarming this Neal's that the house was on fire, the slaves ran away, and it burned down. Now the porticos began to build. That was, I'm sorry, that was May, March 3, 1811. That's the same makeup of Mount Vernon. It the it's the Palladian yeah. style, which yeah. Monticello and Mount Vernon, yeah. Mount Airy, yeah. uh, many of the Virginia plantations yeah. uh, chose as their uh, design. I'm sure as you may have gone over this and may have missed it, but how, how is it that he made his fortune? The question is, how did Glenner has it make his fortune? He made it the best possible way. He inherited it. He came from generations of well-to-do landowners in Ireland. He, and his his homestead was 7,000 acres. Northern Ireland? No, no. County Kerry, which is this. County Kerry, which is in southwestern Ireland, the extreme western edge of Europe. Kerry is very beautiful. He was not a Catholic. He belonged to the class of Protestant landowners who had come in chiefly in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the end of the 16th century, and taken the land from the Catholics. There were a few Catholic owners that stayed on the good side of the English government, most of them were Protestant. He belonged to the Church of Ireland, which was the same as the Church of England, Protestant, which is the same as our Episcopal Church here in America. Thank you. You're welcome. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them for you. We have many fewer trees around the house than when this was photographed in the mid-1980s. Rare snow shot. We have, a, we had initially a caretaker who stayed on the island. 
24 hours a day, or if he went off, someone was there. Now we have the assistant superintendent of the park who lives there in a log house just behind the mansion. The first part of the house to be furnished after the house was built was the summer kitchen. It's a very large building. It's a 12 by, I'm sorry, it's 18 by 18 feet. And it's one of the best furnished, most authentically and completely furnished 18th century kitchens in the United States. This is the other wing building, which served as Blennerhatchet's library, office, and laboratory, as the British say. That's the north wing building. The summer kitchen was in the south wing building. As you're looking at the house, the kitchen's on the left. Blennerhatchet's study is on the right. And this is more shots of the study. We now have curtains in this. These slides are a little out of date. This is the entrance hall to the mansion. How many of you have been through the mansion? This one gentleman here. May I ask? Yes. Maybe this is, should be addressed to Pamela. But should we plan on spending some time? Will, will we be able to go through the house for tour? Or? We can work that in depending upon your arrival time. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll email you and let you know what sure. we plan, and maybe we might have to adjust that. Sure. So that's one of the questions. Go ahead, I'm sorry. We're especially anxious for you to have time to graze the gift shops. Of course. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Our gift shops earned $118,000 last year. We have a new manager, and he's just burning up the turf. Yes. This is the entrance hall of the mansion, again. <coughs> Dining room. This is the silver pern we bought in Louisville, Kentucky. It dates to about 1810. These are mirrors we bought in Tennessee from a 1790s Tennessee plantation. Do you know what kind of bird is on top of that? It's actually a looking glass, not a mirror. Yeah. Leonard has this time, a mirror was designed for one purpose, and that was to reflect light back into the room. You had mirrors on your mantel to reflect the lights of the lamps and the candles. But it was really a bad problem once the sun went down lighting your house. So you didn't have electricity. A looking glass was what you made to reflect human features. You know? So they had those differentiated in the Leonard has this time. We call everything now a mirror. Does anyone know what bird that is? It's a very popular decorative element in the federal period. Of America was just getting started as an independent nation. It's a phoenix. You all know the, the story of the phoenix? It goes back to ancient Egypt. He's flying along one day. He smells smoke. He looked back and he was on far. And he burned up and crashed ground and just a pile of ashes and then a miracle happened. The ashes started to move and a new body arose. The bird had been reborn. So that's still with us today. Phoenix, Arizona. We have a, an auto supply place, place in Parkburg called the Phoenix Auto Supply. So on so we like that idea of rebirth. So we have several mirrors with the Phoenix on. And this is a rare shot of our dining room chairs being used because they are off limits, verboten. We have a German TV professor, producer come to film part of his documentary on West Virginia. And he plopped himself down on one of the chairs and I said, raisez-vous, raisez-vous. <laughs> he didn't like being told what to do. This is during our la largest special event of the year, which is candlelight. We have this every second weekend in October. And we ban most of the electricity from the island. The house is lighted by candles. Outside we have torches that light the paths. We have music, we have lots of food. We have music in the house. We have country music where you sit on hay bales and watch people dance and eat listen to the music. And these are some of our volunteers who perform in the mansion 
<coughs> pretending to dine at the Black Castle's party. This is the lower drawing room, which we know from the Blennerhassen's records of their recorded by their youngest son was considered the most beautiful room in the mansion. It was completely paneled in black walnut, polished black walnut from floor to ceiling. Now their black walnut was about this wide. Ours is about this wide. This is the East Parlor. We have a number of original pieces of Bunner has some furniture. This center table here, you we'll see in the foreground, was theirs. This is the West Parlor, which is the companion of the East Parlor. You see the two vases on the mantelpiece right here? Those belong to Bunner has it. They're made of alabaster, which is a soft form of marble. I once asked an expert in glass what the difference in pronunciation was. And sometimes you hear pause, sometimes vase, and he says $50. <laughs> if it's over $50, it's balls. And that was about 20 years ago, so it's probably 75 or 100 now. These are absolutely drop dead gorgeous. Now we will go upstairs. This is the upper drawing room. saw this window that's called a Venetian window later on in the 19th century long after the Blennerhasses were dead it had its name changed to a Palladian window but in their day it was a Venetian window. Margaret's birthplace in England has one of these. You know. This is the library. They had bookcases from floor to ceiling. The bookshelves were covered by green silk curtains. This is the painting over the fireplace. This is the Duchess of Cleveland. This is a 17th century portrait in oils. The Duchess of Cleveland was the principal mistress of Charles II. He had quite a few mistresses, but she led the pack. And she was a gorgeous hussy. She really put him through the ropes, let me tell you. But he hung on to her to the end. So one of her titles is the Countess of Castlemaine. Castlemaine is a small neighborhood in Cary. So I thought it was particularly setting that she ended up in the Blennerhassett Mansion Library. Mm -hmm. This is the Blennerhassett's bedchamber, and there's the matching Venetian window to the one in the upper drawing room. In a Venetian or a Palladian home, outside and inside, everything had a balance. If you had something on one side, you had to have this made on the other side. If you had a a door on one side of the room, you had to have a matching door on the other side. Never, if you had a garden on one side of the house, you had a garden on the other side. Balance was their Sometimes the doors went nowhere. Exactly. We have a fake door in their bedchamber to match the one that does work. This is the ladies' guest bedchamber. This is the nursery. You notice different colored Venetian blinds. Venetian blinds came into this country in the 1760s, so Glenn has built their home 35 years after that. They may have had them, we don't know that they did. Many homes did, certainly public buildings did. And when you ordered your Venetian blinds, you ordered whatever color you wanted. The most popular color was, anyone know? Yellow. Yellow. Pardon? So yellow. Yellow? Uh, no, not Red. yellow. Nice try, though. Red. Not red. White. Not white. Blue. Not blue. <laughs> and not natural wood color. Black. Green. Green, yes. Of course, they're the best. <laughs> In the 18th and early 19th century, Americans believed the color green repelled insects. That's what I do. And there's some, there's some, uh, validity to this because in paint and in dye, for cloth dye, there's more arsenic than in other colors. <laughs> this is the uh, nursery also. This chest belonged to Rufus Putnam, the founder of Marianna. This is the southwest view of the house from behind, or what we consider the behind the house. The point at Parkersburg where you'll get on the boat to go 
come to the island. You will go by stern wheeler. And if you have time, you can ride around the island behind horses and wagons. This is our special big event of the year, candlelight. You see the effect of candlelight on the interior of the house. This is the kitchen where the servants are busy making ginger bread and other things for the quality to be neat upstairs in the upper drawing room dancing, as you see. This year we're having, and you'll be on the island while this is taking place, a Civil War reenactment, and you'll be playing Civil War soldiers. Yes. And they're rough and tough on the ball diamond as well as on the battlefield. Aren't you good around the island a few times before we play? <laughs> Don't see them. I well remember the last time you were on the island. You appeared with two men short on your team, which we supplied. And then you had the ill grace of beating us. <laughs> we thought you could have, you know, faked it a little bit. So. This is uh, the museum. We have a regional history museum in downtown Parkersburg. It shows everything from historic <coughs> Indian relics, 13,000 plus years old, to clothing from the 1970s. Lots of guns, automobiles, etc. We have a number of Blunder Hazard things. This is a night set, which they own. So, get wake up in the night and you're thirsty for yourself a little drinking water. This is a solid gold inkwell box, writing box, belonged to Mrs. Blennerhassett's grandfather, General Agnew, who was killed in the American Revolution fighting the Americans at Germantown, Pennsylvania, in 1777, I think. She went to see his grave there in the 1820s. We got that from the same lady who sold us the miniature. Two examples of the Blunder Hassett's china. We have examples of four sets. Wealthy ladies back then had a set of china for different times of the day. Every different meal, including tea. And the last view of the island at sunset. Have any questions you'd like to ask? Yes, sir. Hey, one question. You said he came from Ireland to here to avoid being hung. Yes. Okay. What made him leave here to go to Montreal? Was he going to be hung again? He had gone to a, left the island, he bought a cotton plantation <coughs> in Mississippi outside of Port Gibson, okay. which is south of Natchez, and they named it Macash, meaning the hiding place. He went broke trying to grow cotton, and he lost the last of his fortune. Oh. So he decided to practice law, for which he'd been trained in Ireland, but never practiced, because his father died and he inherited the fortune. And so he decided to go to Montreal and practice law there, and that didn't work out. He was almost blind by that time. So his sister said, if you come back to Bath, England, where she was living, she told his sister, you can live, you and your family can live with me. They had one young son they took back with them. The two older sons stayed here in America. And that's why he went back to Bath, England. From there, they migrated to the Channel Islands off the coast of France. He died on the Isle of Guernsey in 1831. Margaret survived him 11 years and died in New York City while she was there visiting her second son, Harmon Jr. Uh, Harmon is buried in an unmarked grave on the Isle of Guernsey. The Europeans aren't very sentimental about their dead. And once you've been dead, they often will dig you up. In Austria, you rent a space for 30 years, and then they bring up, dig up the remains, throw them away, put someone else in the shaft. Uh, in England and Ireland, they will take a graveyard that has a good view and take up the tombstones and pave them over. And that's what they did to Blunder Hassett's graveyard, where he was buried on the Isle of Guernsey. Margaret was buried in a cemetery in downtown Manhattan. We exhumed her in 1996, along with her son, Harmon Jr., and she's buried on the island with suitable gravestones near the mansion, where she said her letter she always wanted any other questions? Yes, sir. There was a, a graveyard on the island itself? 
Okay. For the slaves. Okay. Only Has the slaves. Found or no? Pardon? Has the graveyard where it was, is that known or been found? We're not even sure where the slave quarters were. We know okay. roughly they were behind the mansion to the west of the mansion. We are have been conducting for many years archaeological surveys on the island with the new electrical equipment, ground penetrating radar being one of them. But that is super expensive now. You have one big, one summer's big, and it starts at fifty thousand dollars. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You, you said that it lost 300 acres and they built the dam. What, what part of the island is this? I'm looking at there where those, that acre had been on. No. It was from 500 acres to 381 acres it went down. We lost 100 acres. Yeah, a little bit over. <coughs> the tips of them, the upstream lower tip, the head of the island was in a point and it went far up the river, a couple city blocks. <coughs> About five years ago, Pam, six years ago, the Belleville Dam had a barge caught in it and they couldn't close their chambers off. And so the water went down in our area. My boss had to excavate the island because the banks started crumbling. I didn't realize the Ohio River water pressure kept the banks stable, but they do. So they, they made her leave the island. She was then superintendent. And you can see that point is still under the water. It goes way up the river. We have pictures of it. And also, that Belleville Dam, they went through a couple years before and clear cut all the banks. This is the wisdom of the Army Corps of Engineers. <laughs> and let me tell you something. That really eroded the island's banks big time. And we now have it all, the stone all the way around them to keep those, those banks from eroding. Because those big barges come up over and they have that tribulation underwater that hits the banks underwater and crumbles them all right. Any other questions? Which channel is deeper? You know? Which the one Ohio boat? Channel, which is on the right. On the right? Yeah. And, and it wasn't until about 10 or 15 years ago that barge traffic was allowed to use, well, they were always allowed to use the West Virginia South Channel there on the left, but their insurance didn't cover them if they had an accident, if they were in that channel and had an accident. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it.